Hello and welcome to our fourth uh, remote debate uh, of the fall 2020 semester. Uh, I really appreciate everybody joining us. I'm Ted McLoof. I'll be your moderator and host for the evening. Uh, I appreciate the, the views that we've gotten from our past few debates. We're getting larger and larger crowds as the, the word gets out. Uh, our last debate was about the election itself. Our, our resolution was uh, our election system is fair, not rigged. Uh, and luckily enough, the side that was arguing uh, in favor of that ended up winning. So congratulations to uh, Naya and Pat uh, uh, for, for their, uh, their excellent uh, arguments last time. Um, our election right now is, is getting pretty crazy. And as everyone is waiting for the results to come in, you can watch our entire debate tonight to kill time uh, and to be informed and to actually watch some uh, productive rhetoric. Uh, for once in our process. So uh, tonight we are going to be arguing the resolution gun rights are essential to a free society. Uh, this is the resolution that you can either vote affirmative or negative on, either pro or con, for or against. If you are watching this on Facebook, you can find our voting system in the comments section below. If you're watching on YouTube after we've already recorded this, you can find it in the description section of the video itself. Uh, Please make sure that you vote both before and after the debate. As anyone who's tuned into our broadcast before know, we go by Oxford style rules, which means that the winners of the debate are not who get the most votes, but who changes the audience's mind the most from the beginning to the end. So it's essential that you vote uh, prior to the debate and also after the debate so we can see uh, what, the what the shift is from before to after. Uh, as is always the case, you're more than welcome to al always also vote uh, that you're undecided if you don't know exactly what you wanna, uh, how you wanna vote before you hear our excellent debaters. Um, as was also the case last time, we have an absolutely fantastic distinguished speaker with us tonight. Uh, tonight, our speaker will be Adam Winkler. Uh, we really appreciate him joining us. Uh, Adam Winkler is a professor at the UCLA School of Law. He's a specialist in gun policy and American constitutional law. He is the author of two books, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Los Angeles Times. Professor Winkler has had his work cited uh, by many landslides Supreme Court cases and is, the, is, is in the 20 most cited law professors in judicial opinions today. Uh, Professor Winkler, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, live via Zoom from UCLA. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor to be invited to participate in this debate series and uh, to contribute to your uh, the study and discussion of the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms in America. Um, uh, I am uh, coming to you from UCLA Law School, only sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but I uh, hope you'll indulge me a little, uh, uh, and uh, thank you again uh, for having me. I put up on here on my share screen some images for us to look at. Um, and uh, um, my story sort of begins at the Supreme Court that you see pictured here. Uh, here in 2008, I was fortunate enough to be at the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, D.C. It was uh, quite a chilly day in Washington, but uh, that didn't stop a whole mob of protesters, reporters, camera crews, uh, etc., from gathering in front of the famous marble staircase of the Supreme Court. And the justices were going to hear a case on one of the most heated issues in America, uh, guns. And the case that the court was scheduled to hear was called District of Columbia versus Heller. And it was the first Supreme Court case on the Second Amendment in over 70 years. And everyone there knew it was going to be a landmark ruling. Uh, the crowd on the street was sort of a microcosm of the gun debate in America. Uh, a gun rights supporter walked up and down the street with a bullhorn. More guns, he yelled. Less crime, a, fellow, a group of fellow gun lovers shouted back. More guns, less crime. Uh, a group of gun control supporters tried to break up their rhythm, and after one chant of more guns, they shouted as loud as they could, more death. But in the end, however, the two sides on the street in front of the Supreme Court were, like so many of us do in the gun debate, really just yelling past each other not coming together to any kind of common agreement. Now, the Second Amendment to the Constitution is in some ways notorious for its ambiguity. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. 
It's almost as if James Madison, the author of the Second Amendment, had just discovered this wonderful new thing, the comma, and wanted to put it in there as many times as possible. And really, ever since, the text of the Second Amendment has confused generations of Americans. Now, if we want to understand why the framers included the Second Amendment in the Constitution, uh, let me take you back a little bit to the days before America was born, back to the 1680s and this man, James II, the King of England. Now, James was the last Catholic monarch in England, and among the Protestant majority in England, he was not very popular. Uh, many worried that he would be an agent of the Pope. And once he assumed the throne, James revealed an even, oh, sorry, an even more dangerous uh, set of beliefs than his Catholicism. He believed in the divine right of kings. He thought Parliament had no authority to limit his power, and when Parliament objected, he disbanded Parliament for the rest of his reign. When notables petitioned him to reconsider, he threw them in jail without due process for the mere offense of complaining, of bringing to him their grievances. He also sent his security force out into the countryside to disarm the Protestant dissenters so that they couldn't rebel. Now, eventually, the English had had enough, and James was overthrown. Uh, and James had so little support in England that he was forced to flee with barely a battle. And this series of events in England is known, in English history, is known as the Glorious Revolution. And what made it glorious was not just that it was the rarest of rares, a bloodless revolution. There was no real fighting and the king just fled. Um, it was also glorious because the new monarchs, William and Mary, agreed to a new set of clear limits on the power of the throne and new protections for the fundamental rights of Englishmen, the English Bill of Rights. Among its many provisions were guarantees to respond to the kinds of abuses of power by King James, uh, including a guarantee of due process of law, a guarantee of the right to pet petition your government for redress of your grievances, and even a limited uh, guarantee of the right to possess arms. Uh, one provision said that subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. The English Bill of Rights would be the model upon which the Founding Fathers would base their own version a century later. In the 1770s, uh, a century after James II, uh, another English king, uh, sought once again to disarm his political opponents. King George III sought to quell the rebellious colonists, imposing ever harsher measures to maintain their subjugation. And one of those measures was the confiscation of the colonists' guns. Now, we all know the famous story of uh, Paul Revere, who rode through the countryside of Massachusetts, warning the British are coming, the British are coming. And where were the British coming to? Well, they were going to Lexington and Concord, where the colonists had stored their arsenal of guns. The founding generation feared that if King George took their guns, they would be at his mercy, left defenseless against his tyranny. Now, guns were prized possessions of the American colonists. Um, uh, they had no standing army. They feared a corrupt leader could use the army to oppress the people, as monarchs like James II and George III had done. National defense relied instead on militias composed of ordinary people. And when danger arose, the citizen militia would be called up and the men would grab their guns from home or from the store, the arsenal, the local arsenal where they were stored and be ready to fight in an instant. Hence the famous term, the Minutemen. Now, of course, the founders also value, value guns for other reasons too. Thomas Jefferson, who received his first gun at the age of 10, was a tinkerer and a scientist who appreciated the gun's mechanical properties and what he saw as its positive effect on mental discipline. In a 1785 letter to his 15-year-old nephew, Jefferson prescribed a detailed regimen of self-improvement. Quote, a strong body makes the mind strong. As to the species of exercise, I advise the gun. While this gives a moderate exercise to the body, it gives boldness, enterprise, and independence to the mind. Games played with the ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stamp no character on the mind. Let your gun, therefore, be your constant companion on your walks, Jefferson wrote. Quote, never think of taking a book with you, end quote. Now, after the revolution uh, was won, the framers of the Constitution sought to protect against future tyranny 
by guaranteeing a set of individual rights. And the Second Amendment was, of course, part of that effort. Now, some people in the gun community today point to the Second Amendment and insist that any regulation of guns and gun owners violates the Second Amendment's promise that the right to keep and bear arms, quote, shall not be infringed. But in fact, the founders who wrote the Second Amendment had wide ranging gun control laws and imposed numerous requirements upon gun owners. The founders believed in gun rights, but they also believed in restricting guns where they thought public safety required it. The founders disarmed uh, portions of the population that they thought couldn't be trusted from uh, some of the obvious uh, that you might expect. Slaves were disarmed and were not allowed to own guns or carry guns. Um, uh, they also disarmed free blacks who had a lot of the other rights uh, of uh, white citizens. But it wasn't just a racial thing. Uh, it was also uh, the founders also disarmed law abiding white people, namely loyalists. Loyalists weren't traitors. They were political dissenters who thought that uh, sticking with England was the right political thing to do. And they comprised about 40% of the white population at the time of the revolution. So we're not talking about some small little band of, uh, of traitors. We're talking about serious political opponents of one of the most important political movements in American history, the movement for American independence. Now, the founders also imposed demanding requirements on gun owners. Uh, remember the citizens who formed the militias? They were required to appear at public musters with their guns in hand, where they and their weapons would be registered on public rolls. The founding fathers believed in the right to bear arms, but they, in their view, the right was not a libertarian license for anyone to have any gun and take it anywhere one wanted without any regulation. They balanced gun rights with regulation when they thought it was necessary to promote public safety. Now, there's no time or place in American history that's thought to embody America's gun culture more than the Wild West. You know the image, cowboys with two six shooters on their hips, rifles in their hands, maybe even a little Derringer pistol concealed beneath a pant leg. And they're so loaded down with iron, it's amazing they can even mount their horses like that, right? And, you know, it's true that guns were popular in the Wild West. Um, but the right to bear arms on the frontier wasn't about protecting against government tyranny in the same way that the founders thought about gun rights. Guns were valuable as a means of personal protection in the frontier. When you were riding out in the vast wilderness of the Wild West, you needed a gun to protect you against wild animals, against bandits, against hostile native tribes that you might encounter. Generations have been taught that frontier towns on the Wild West were filled with violence, duels at high noon, cowboys running roughshod, guns ablaze, night and day. Yet it turns out that when you went into a frontier town back in the Wild West, a place like Tombstone or Dodge City, you were subject to the most restrictive gun laws in America at the time. When Dodge City residents first organized a government in 1873, the very first law they adopted was a gun control law they banned the carrying of concealed weapons. Later, the city also banned the open carry of firearms. In many frontier towns, uh, travelers were required to check their guns when they arrived. Uh, you might not be able to see it so closely on this image that I have, but this is a sign from Dodge City uh, that was out in the roads back in the late 1870s. And the sign says the carrying of firearms strictly prohibited. And so when you came to town, you couldn't carry your gun around. You had to was check your gun either at the stable where you left your horses or with the sheriff, and you'd get a little token or a claim check and retrieve your gun on the way out of town. Guns were commonplace, but so, again, have been efforts to try to preserve public safety through the regulation of firearms. Now, today, the National Rifle Association, oh, there was a little, I did have a little bit more of a, a magnified uh, photograph of that sign. You can see it says the carrying of firearms strictly prohibited. It also says you should try prickly ash bitters, which were apparently a, <laughs> a, a common remedy at the time for any ailment that would, uh, I'm sure it was all fallacious too. Um, but uh, in any case, um, uh, so the Nash, today, the National Rifle Association is widely seen as a no compromises opponent of gun control. But it wasn't always this way. And the NRA used to favor and advocate for gun restrictions. In the 1920s and the 1930s, for instance, the NRA helped draft the Uniform Firearms Act, a model law that restricted the concealing 
uh, the, the carrying of concealed weapons on public streets. It was adopted in nearly every state. The Second Amendment didn't become the lifeblood of the NRA until the 1960s and the 1970s. And perhaps surprisingly, one inspiration for the modern gun rights movement and its focus on the Second Amendment was, of all people, the Black Panthers. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was started in Oakland in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, two young men disillusioned with the progress of the civil rights movement. They were inspired, inspired by Malcolm X's motto, by any means necessary. And for both Malcolm X and the Black Panthers, that meant guns. Racial minorities needed firearms, they believed, to protect against government tyranny. In this case, government tyranny in the form of hostile police officers who didn't respect the rights of racial minorities. As Malcolm X said, article number two of the constitutional amendments provides you and me the right to own a rifle or a shotgun. Now, Newton and Seal, acting in Oakland, decided to carry those guns when they began policing the police. They organized armed patrols to oversee police officers in black neighborhoods. They'd follow around a cop car and shout out instructions to anyone who was pulled over by the police. As you can imagine, the Oakland police were none too happy to be followed by a group of armed African-American civil rights activists. Um, and, uh, uh, and so at the urging of law enforcement, California lawmakers decided to adopt a, a new gun control law aimed at stopping the Black Panthers from carrying their loaded guns in public. The Panthers went to the state capitol in Sacramento to lobby against the law and they decided to take their guns with them. They were there to protest what they saw as an infringement of their Second Amendment rights. Um, a new story at the time reported, quote, it was one of the most amazing incidents in legislative history, a tumultuous traveling group of grim-faced, silent young men with guns roaming the Capitol, surrounded by reporters, television cameramen, stunned state police, and watched by incredulous groups of visiting school children, end quote. There was no metal detector at the California State House at the time, uh, so they were able to walk uh, right in uh, to the most important building in California, loaded guns in hand, and it was all legal. Nothing in California law prohibited them from carrying those guns into the State House. There was no restriction on guns in the State House, and as long as they carried them as they do in this photograph, where they're not pointing them at anyone, thus in a non-threatening manner, this was deemed to be perfectly lawful conduct. The 1967 incident, though, did propel the Black Panthers into the national spotlight and contributed to a new round of gun control laws. Indeed, the year this happened, 1967, disorder was everywhere in the United States. Newark and Detroit witnessed the worst race riots in American history. When police and National Guardsmen came to restore order, they were often shot at by snipers. A federal report on the riots put part of that blame on the easy availability of guns. The next year, two of America's foremost political leaders, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, were assassinated. And the riots and the assassinations uh, and uh, the, uh, in, uh, the example of the Black Panthers all led Congress in 1968 to pass the first significant federal gun control law in 30 years, the Gun Control Act of 1968. Uh, the law had a variety of provisions. It restricted the importation of cheap handguns, known as Saturday, Saturday night specials. It expanded licensing requirements for gun dealers and barred gun possession by felons, substance abusers, uh, and uh, uh, people who uh, suffered from severe mental illness of various sorts. And the NRA at the time supported the Gun Control Act of 1968. Uh, and in the early 1970s, uh, the NRA's leadership actually decided uh, to retreat from political activity. Uh, the leadership decided they were gonna move the headquarters from the Washington DC area to Colorado Springs, where the organization would focus on hunting and conservation uh, rather than battling gun control. This angered a group of hardliners within the membership at the time, led by uh, this man, Harlan Carter. In the early, the early 70s were a time of starkly rising crime rates, and Harlan Carter, uh, among others in the NRA, believed that guns were primarily about self-protection in a time of rising crime rates, rather than just about duck hunting or outdoors activity. 
Carter also believed that the Gun Control Act and other gun laws of that period were an abomination, the first step towards total gun confiscation. Indeed, it seems that the gun laws that were in part designed to limit access to guns by leftist black radicals sparked something of a backlash by right-leaning white conservatives who were afraid that the government was coming to get their guns too. And at the annual meeting of the membership of the NRA in 1977, Carter staged a coup. Carrying out a well-orchestrated secret effort, Carter and his group of insurgents used the organization's rules of order uh, to uh, lead a revolt of the membership. And when the sun rose the next day uh, in 1977, the entire leadership of the NRA had been completely replaced and Harlan Carter had become the organization's new leader. And under Carter, the NRA stayed in Washington. It abandoned any efforts to move to Colorado Springs, instead redoubling its efforts to fight the political battles to defeat gun restrictions. The NRA and American politics more generally have really never been the same since. Now in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court case we began our discussion with, um, uh, the Supreme Court held for the very first time that the Second Amendment to the Constitution unambiguously guaranteed individuals the right to have guns for their own personal protection. That decision was hailed at the time uh, as a triumph of originalism because the court looked to the history of America to declare that the Second Amendment guaranteed an individual right to bear arms. Yet the court's decision departed from originalism in important ways. The Supreme Court did not say that the Second Amendment was about protecting against government tyranny, the view of the Second Amendment most prominent in the founding era, era and also prominent among the Black Panthers. Instead, the court said that the Second Amendment was about personal protection against common criminals, adopting the view of guns that really stems from a later period in American history, one that's much closer in time to the Wild West of the 1870s than it is to the founding in the early 1900s. The uh, early, uh, sorry, uh, in the uh, uh, late 1780s. Um, back in the 1780s, the technology of guns were such that was such that they weren't very effective as a tool to defend your home or to defend against a criminal because you couldn't keep a gun loaded at the time. It was a fire safety risk. Um, and so because of that, you couldn't keep a gun loaded. It would take you about a minute to load a gun. If a criminal's crawling through your window, you're probably grabbing a billy club or a knife rather than trying to spend a minute to load one shot of your firearm. And then uh, if you miss, you're going to have to load it again, which would take another minute. So this idea of the Second Amendment about personal protection is really a more modern conception. That is to say, at least it arises in a much later time period than the founding it said, itself. Um, uh, and the court's decision was hailed by many, especially many in the gun rights community. Uh, although I think in many ways, the court's decision was a split decision. The court did recognize an individual right to have guns and said that the government can't ban handguns. Um, at the same time, the court also said that nothing in the opinion should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. So and the court also made clear it's constitutional to ban dangerous and unusual weapons like machine guns. In short, the court made clear that uh, the vast majority of gun laws on the books today in America are constitutionally permissible. Indeed, in the 12 years since the Heller case was decided, the lower courts have ruled in hundreds of cases on the constitutionality of a wide variety of gun control laws. In the overwhelming majority of these cases, the gun laws have been upheld. So long as people are allowed to possess commonplace guns in their home, the courts generally say that the Second Amendment isn't truly infringed by less burdensome restrictions. But what does the future hold? Well, uh, we have uh, uh, three new justices on the Supreme Court appointed by President Trump. All of them are expected to have very broad views of the Second Amendment. and be relatively skeptical of gun control laws. And in the coming years, we are likely to see the Supreme Court decide whether states can ban military style assault rifles, whether states can restrict high capacity magazines, whether states can put in place red flag laws to temporarily dispossess someone in crisis from their guns. 
how exactly the court rules in these cases is not clear. Uh, but one thing is certain, that America's century-long debate over guns is far from over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wengler. Uh, if I could ask you a few questions, because there's there's a lot of curious things. Uh, I think the, the the most pressing question that that I have, especially since you went through so many decades where we seem to have slightly more lax gun control laws as we were sort of figuring all of this stuff out. Uh, what do you think? I know this is kind of a, a pretty heavy question to ask, but what do you think accounts for the fact that we have so many more mass shootings uh, recently with it when the, in the past few decades than we ever had before when we had slightly more lax gun laws? Well, that's a good question. And uh, mass shootings have really become one of the big issues in the American gun debate today. Uh, you know, of course, we've always had terrorist attacks where people targeted mass groups of citizens. Uh, uh, you know, back in the early 1900s, do a lot of historical work in there. There's always these stories of, about anarchists who are blowing themselves up or trying to shoot some candidate and shoot a few more people along them. So we've always had, you know, the threat of violence and violence being used for, uh, um, for people to try to make some kind of statement. Um, I think that, so that, I think that's because it's sort of always been there. Um, I think today what we see happening is that uh, these killings have become very, very high profile. And so now we get a lot of copycat killers, uh, for lack of a better term. You get people who might not have thought that an answer to their problems or a way to make a name for themselves or a way to die uh, would be to go kill a bunch of school children. But when you see a lot of people, when you see other people doing that, and then they get a lot of notoriety, uh, even if it's very negative notoriety. Uh, um, if someone, it, it, obviously we're talking about people who are dealing with violence issues and maybe clouded judgment in the first place, um, they might think of that as an appealing option. So I think now it's kind of an availability heuristic, like it's, it's, mm. it's thought of as sort of an available option. And so now we see more, a higher use of it and higher, uh, more people going to it as a, as a way of making some kind of statement or, or finding a way to die that makes a me sends a message to people. Um, I don't think it's necessarily tied to gun control. We don't see any uh, vast differences in mass shootings in states that have restrictive gun control and states that don't have restrictive gun control. In every state in the union, it's pretty easy to get a gun. You might have a waiting period in a place like where I live, California, 10 days, but that's not the biggest burden in the whole world, uh, you know, uh, for most gun owners at least. Well, that actually is it's funny you say that, Professor Because actually that that sort of uh, really easily kind of transitions me into the other question I wanted to ask. The last thing I want to do is inject politics into a week where we seem to all be inundated with politics. But as you mentioned, I mean, guns are available to everybody. And as you mentioned what, during, you know, your, your, your great historical speech there, uh, I mean, groups like the Black Panthers and certainly, you know, heavily in the African-American community now, um, are also very much, you know, have high levels of gun ownership. Why is it that when this conversation usually comes up, it's so often drawn in, in party lines when, when it's not necessarily a conservative, liberal, left, right, red, blue issue? Right. Well, it is one of those issues that's become increasingly red, blue, uh, and, and really defined by partisanship. Uh, it wasn't always this way, but like everything in American politics, it seems to be filtered now through these political party lenses. And now it's very hard to find, uh, for instance, a Democrat who favors uh, broad gun rights. And, uh, and, and in fact, like if you look at the last presidential election, uh, the Democratic candidates in the primaries were like falling all over themselves to mm -hmm. articulate new and more restrictive gun control regimes. Sure. Um, and on the Republican side, you have absolutely nobody who's willing to even support universal background checks who can stand on the stage of the Republican primary. So we have really sorted a, a, on this issue. We shouldn't, uh, guns are a very uh, hot button issue, a very controversial issue. Um, uh, and ones that often do divide in red and blue circles uh, in some ways, uh, because a lot of people in urban environments who are blue Democrats, they don't have they don't have guns. They don't have a lot of experience with guns. They're not dealing with guns uh, except when they're uh, seen on TV with being used by criminals or drug dealers. Um, and in a lot of rural places. Um, the people have guns everywhere and they're being used by everybody and no one's causing any problems and they don't see it as a crime problem. So uh, it is kind of 
associated with those dynamics that do uh, shape so much of our politics. Is that a, do you do you feel like that might be a, is that a, a lobbying issue? Is that because of the sort of the 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 money that that groups like the NRA have in order to to inject that kind of partisanship into the issue, or 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 is that just sort of or is it more of an ideology thing? I think one of the things that really contributes to this partisan divide, uh, at least makes it uh, worse than it might otherwise be, uh, is uh, legislative districting. Um, uh, that we have in, in our country now, um, thanks to the computer enhanced, uh, uh, the ability to draw these districts with computer enhancement where you can literally go block by block to determine exactly who the voters will be in your district. Um, we have the growing uh, use of safe seats and now uh, virtually all seats are safe seats, whether they're for Democrats or Republicans. What that means is that the only election that matters is the primary election in that safe seat, whether it's for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And if it's the only the primary that matters, that really uh, it really enhances the extremes on both sides. Um, that in primary elections, you get the most committed, most extreme voters uh, in that party as compared to the general election. And so um, uh, you, you know if you're a Republican and you support gun control, even something like that seems innocuous, like adding um, uh, people th who are on the terrorist watch list to a no buy list uh, uh, or universal background checks that have very, very broad support among the public, you don't see anyone really so favoring that because they're afraid they're gonna get primaried and have a primary opponent who will win uh, in the next primary and they won't uh, they won't keep their seat. And so I do think that legislative districting and the use of safe seats mm -hmm. and the incumbent protection racket that we have with legislative districting in America uh, just sort of exacerbates some of the problems. That's, I, I mean, that that's, a, that's an excellent point. And it actually kind of leads me to my last question that I wanted to ask you, which, uh, and then I'll let you go, but I think this will nicely sort of parlay us into the, the debate proper. Uh, so obviously, most of the arguments that we seem to have in America have to do with public good versus personal freedoms, right? Uh, but it's interesting to me that something like, uh, let's say, abortion is something that conservatives tend to argue in favor of big government and, and, and sort of more restrictive laws. Uh, whereas when it comes to something like guns, uh, uh, liberals will argue for, for bigger government, more restrictive laws. Um, would you say that gun rights are, can you, can you distinct, make distinguish, uh, make distinct, uh, how are gun rights a, as a different kind of sort of personal, personal freedom issue than other kind of personal freedom versus public good issues? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things to do, uh, no matter which side you are on in the gun issue, uh, is often the people who favor gun rights are often people who uh, oppose abortion rights. Not always, uh, definitely not always the case, but that's often the case. And it's often, I think, helpful if you support one or the other of those um, to question whether you would accept restrictions on guns that you would accept on abortion and vice versa. Like if you think that abortion should be restricted, are you willing to accept similar limits on guns? Now you can come up with arguments for why that you shouldn't apply that rule. And maybe you think gun rights are protected by the constitution and privacy rights aren't, you know, there's different arguments. But if you believe that those are at least two viable potential rights, one way of thinking about it is to measure your own uh, c commitment to those issues by thinking about how that same rule applies to other rights. I think every right is unique. You know, sometimes they say, well, the Second Amendment is being treated like a second class right because courts are upholding a lot of forms of gun control. Um, but I think every right, it has to be taken on its own. You know, you have the right to vote, but it's only on Tuesdays, right? Mm -hmm. Only on Election Day. It, it ain't no good for you on, yeah, on Saturday or on Sunday. Well, you know, with extended voting, who knows? Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and you have the right to, uh, you know, uh, you have the right to uh, intimacy with your partner. You don't have the right to do that on a public street. You're going to get arrested <laughs> for that, right? So every right is kind of different. And, uh, you know, uh, we should take the right to bear arms seriously as a right, which means uh, accepting that uh, you can't control them in every way you wish. But it's also worth recognizing that like speech and like other aspects of our, our rights is that the government does limit them. Uh, we have property rights, but we also have limitations on those property rights in order so that we have a public, uh, you know, most of the restrictions on public, on private property, on how you can develop your property and what kind of sanitation you have to have, how big it is, uh, health codes, safety codes, fire codes, like they're all done for reasons of public safety, right, to keep people safe. And generally what we do is we 
allow when there's real genuine interest in public safety restrictions on rights. Um, and gun rights are, I think, shouldn't be immune from that larger concern as well. And I think the story of guns in American history shows that we've often recognized the right to bear arms, and that we're not going to totally disarm the civilian population. But there still is place within that right for restrictions that can enhance public safety.